Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Okay, everybody, welcome to our good news segment. And I'm so, you know, I love these good news segments. I'm so excited since we started them. Hunter Ham is joining me here today. Well, why? Winner of an amazing competition. Are you ready for it? Who has the stinkiest sneakers in the land? Now, if you play table tennis with me, I bet you my friends might want to debate this. Also joining us here today is Dr. Rachel Hurd, neuroscience leading world expert on the psychology science of smell. Thank you both for joining us here today. Uh, let me start out with you, Dr. Hurd. Uh, again, we are here to honor Hunter. I want to get a sense from you before we talk with Hunter directly. I want to get a sense from you of What is it we are working with in today's environment, in today's world, with smell? And the reason I'm interested in this is in in finding out from you whether or not our senses are being dulled by so many different smells we're being bombarded with every day. Or did I just make that up in my mind? Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you, Dr. Pat. It's great to be on. So first of all, you are not right in saying that we're being dulled. We're just able to smell so much more. So all the different smells that are out there, we can smell them all extremely well. The only thing that can interfere with our sense of smell is if we're smelling one particular smell for a long time. We actually don't, uh, we lose our sensitivity to that specific smell, but other smells we can smell just as well. So having thousands of smells around us is just as good for our nose as having only a few. And the good thing is if we have a lot of variety in what we're sniffing, then we can sniff everything we want. And unfortunately for me, that meant I could smell Hunter's stinky sneakers extremely well. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You know, it's really interesting. What I'm really struck by is the, the contrast of things. We, we very much relate to the smell of something that taps into our emotional. So for me, I grew up in an Italian family, right? And I want to say one of the most delicious smells for me is that roasted garlic going on to a delicious pizza top. The other hand, we also know about smells from Hunter. Hunter, congratulations. And how does this feel to you to be the super winner? Um, well, it means a lot to me. Did you think you were going to win? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> How did you get the reputation of having the stinkiest sneakers in the land? What, what, did you, what do you have to do to get that? Well, you have to, like, you have to, like, get them, you have to get them stinky, and, like, you need to, like, mostly... You need to be active. If you just, like, say, I, like, crack some eggs over it and put some spoiled milk over it, it's not really, like, they want you, like, they want, they really want you to, like, they want it to be natural, like, you're not yeah. doing really that much stuff to it. Yeah, like, you're putting on your sneakers and then you're going out and you're playing around or you're going out and maybe you're going fishing, but you got them sneakers on, right? You know, there's nothing worse than about 10 days of fish smell on those sneakers, is there? Well, I don't, I don't know. I <laughs> nothing worse. <laughs> I, I agree. There's uh, Take it from somebody like me and, and you, doctor, like, I mean, my gosh, you ever go, you ever, you ever take the family fishing and then the, everything goes in the car, right? But what is it, Doctor, that you discovered about Hunter Sneakers that set him apart for the numero uno prize? 
So what I like to look for is what I call the trifecta of terrible. And Hunter had it all. He had that kid spirit, funky, sweaty smell in his sneakers. He had also what you've just mentioned, and for me, a smell that I find particularly repulsive, which is a rotted fish smell, because Hunter did a lot of fishing and had even had fish eggs in his shoes. And then there's a lot of this dirt and rotted other stuff, maybe a little poop here and there. So, you know, he had it all going for him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, Hunter, from you, you were just being you, right? You're just you were just out there being a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter, did you ever think about whether or not, okay, I'm going, I'm I'm getting out there, I'm being me, I'm outside. Did you ever think for one minute that this would be an award you would get from them sneakers? Well, no, probably no, not really. I don't really ever think that. I know. I got to ask you a question. Are these like your favorite sneakers? Because I have a favorite pair of sneakers, and everybody around me wants to throw wants me to throw them out, and I'm just not ready to do that. Well, they were very good, but I stopped wearing them because they had a lot of mud on them for a while. But then I uh, hosed them off, and then I dried them out, and then and I started wearing them again. Yeah, that's me. Exactly. Um, I want to get back to you, Dr. Hertz, for a minute. You know, we're talking about this because in addition to talking about sensation and perception, which is so important, and I know your research on that is outstanding, we're also talking about a solution for this. Hence, our friends at Odor Eaters. And for those of you out there, www.odor-eaters.com. Um, this is really a campaign to say, can we do anything about it? And if so, what is it we can do? So Odor Eaters has a great set of products to help deodorize feet, and specifically that is take the odor out of all the smelly sneakers that are out there, whether it's kids or adults, and there's foot sprays that you can use to help minimize sweat. There's things you can put in your shoes to help neutralize the odors. There's powders you can put on that also help not only with regular sweat, but if you have any foot-related conditions that can help with that too. So anything to help foot care and smell care from the ankle down, odor eaters can help with. Yeah. I mean, this is really kind of today, you know, when we get to choose, do I want to smell really cool, delicious things? Or do I really want to know that, you know, both Hunter and Dr. Pat just put their sneakers in an open bag in my car? Right. So this is, a, I mean, our, our issue with smell is often other people's smells more than our own smell. <laughs> One of the things is we often, you know, actually like our own smells, and we're also usually fairly adapted to them because we smell it so often we really can't smell it. But other people can smell our smells, and we often don't want to create a bad impression with that, so we like to be able to smell nice. And that's one of the things that we can do with products like Odor Eaters to help our feet smell prettier. Yeah, I, I, let's stop for a moment, and I want to make sure because I know the this this short time we spend together like zips right by. Um, what is the best way for people to find out more, and how can all of us stinky sneaker people celebrate Hunter? <laughs> well, you can go to odoreaters.com and also my website rachelhurst.com, and I'm sure you can just Google this Odor Eaters Rotten Sneakers contest and find out more about it. I think. We're going to be on YouTube as well as mm-hmm. a bunch of different shows over the next couple of hours. So you'll be able to see more about Hunter and everything that he did to get his sneakers horribly stinky that way. Okay, so my friends are saying that, you know, maybe next year they're going to just be sending my sneakers in. But you know what? I'm sorry. I'm not giving them up. Okay, I want to ask you this question. Tell us about the contest. How many people were involved in it? And how did you narrow it down? And uh, did you use your sniffer to do this? So this year we actually had a somewhat fewer contestants than usual. So there were only six, which I have to say, thank goodness, there were only six. <laughs> and yes, unfortunately, my nose is what does the judging. I have to <laughs> smell, put my nose inside each of those stinky sneakers and decide which was the worst, but also in addition to the worst smell, because there were, I would have to say, more than just Hunter had really stinky feet. But we're also looking at how horrible the shoes look. And as Hunter mentioned, his were really dirty and grimy and more or less falling apart. 
and that helped him be the winner this year. Oh, man. Hunter, let me ask you this question. Uh, I know that you're going to be celebrating this. This is a big competition for you, and congratulations on it. Here's my question that I got to get out of here. What has your family said about them sneakers? My brother is, well, he and me, we, like, pretty much put the same things on our shoes, and we both thought they, were, they both smelled bad. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, how, how about your family? I mean, are they like, oh, my gosh, congratulations for winning, because now we know that in our own minds, we were right about them sneakers. Yeah, well... When when I went up to when I went up to them, they I like congra- they congratulated me, and yeah. Burning question for you guys. Last question, Hunter, are you still gonna wear them sneakers? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you both for joining me here today. I know you got to zip off to another interview. We're going to be talking about this more. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Awesome. Who has the stinkiest sneakers in the land? Underham does. We'll be right back. Integrate spirituality into your everyday lives on Universe Soul Heart Radio. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio as Kathleen Johnson explores the concept of sensible spirituality, keeping you grounded, connected, and centered on the path to wholeness. Kathleen has dedicated her life to facilitating holistic healing and wholeness in others. Listen to Universe Soul Heart Radio and learn how to flourish, grow, and impact all we do on planet Earth. For more information, go to universesoulheart.net. Tune in to the hit show, Raging Skillet Radio, mouthing off with Chef Rossi. Chef Rossi mouths off about different subjects in pursuit of breaking down walls and opening up your minds. She and Dr. Pat banter back and forth, taking from the headlines of the day on subjects that reach beyond what goes on in the world into your hearts. And go to theragingskillet.com to find out more and let Chef Rossi know what's on your mind. Holistic Medical Center is where you find it all. A healthy space with doctors who care, see, and listen to the whole you. Hi, this is Dr. Darvish. If you have not found an answer to your chronic symptoms, you will find answers here at Holistic Medical Center. Our doctors find the root cause of your symptoms and guide your body towards healing naturally. We transform lives from within. Visit drdarvish.com or call 425-451-0404. Are you traveling most of your day? Do you want to take Transformation Talk Radio with you anywhere you go? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. Just go to the App Store on your Apple device or the Google Play Store on your Android and search Transformation Talk Radio. Catch all of our live shows no matter where you are. Thanks for listening. Are you stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a life of inspiration, love, self-acceptance, and fun? Sounds like you're on the verge, on the verge to your next big thing. Join Laura Richer, host of On The Verge Radio, helping you use your breakdown for a breakthrough, overcome life's greatest challenges, and live the life you want and deserve. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio or visit seattlehealinghypnosis.com for more information. The Janice Underwood Show, helping you create the life you want, not the life you tolerate. Tune in each Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio as Janice delves into the life creator system and the next step in your spiritual evolution. Janice Underwood is gifted at helping spiritually minded people shift their mindsets to unleash the creator within. Our souls wish to wake us up those of us listening hear the call do you for more information visit janiceunderwood.com Hey, everybody. 
everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to be connecting with all of you. Yay! Welcome. Hi, Benny. How you doing? Hi, Pat. Doing very well. Yeah, what'd you think about Stinky Sneaker? Yeah, I'm no, I'm in, not, obviously not in Hunter's League at all. Like, I have oh a pretty God. large shoe collection, and if Ooh, they even boy. just, you know, just started to get a little smelly, uh, no, yeah. Well, thanks to our friends at Odor Eaters right? for doing that every day. I did and, like his comment uh, real fast on how he said uh, he wouldn't wear them anymore just because they had a little bit of mud on them. I'm like, really? Oh, my <laughs> that's, gosh. Well, that's, 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 yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, it's like, yeah, I heard that too. But in the end, here we are. And, uh, you know, it's funny about the sneakers. Ever since I did that little interview, I've been like super way more uh, aware. Oh, yeah, a little more um, paranoid. <laughs> a little bit more paranoid. Yeah. And, you know, I actually, reading this book today and, and getting ready to talk to Cal Garrison, it's really kind of cool. And the book is The Lunar, right, Gospel, The Hi. Complete Guide to Your Astrological Moon. Probably where those shoes of Hunter needs to go. Yeah, it's yeah pro- right. <laughs> exactly. On the moon. Stay very, very far away. <laughs> totally on the moon. Uh, but if you're like me on my planet, then you're going to send them to Jupiter. So what do you think about that? Uh, there you go. <laughs> that's that's where I'd like to send a few people too. But listen, today is all about my very, very special guest joining me here today. You know, you guys have heard me talk about uh, astrology from time to time, but you've also heard me talk about um the various ways people have talked to me about my chart and then in turn talk to you all. Today, this is really fascinating. I don't think Cal has left anything out of this book. But what is it about the moon that all of us want to know more about? And how about those of us from a very early age have been in awe of the moon? Something about it. What is it about that energy? You know, why is it for years and years and years as a kid, if you came into my room, I had the biggest giant poster of a werewolf on my wall. What is that about? Today, Cal's going to talk about what the importance of the moon's position is in the birth chart and what that means for all of the above. The natal sun, the ascending side, the lunar nodes, A, B, C, D, E, all of the above. Uh, Cal, thank you for joining us here today. It's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I first of all, let me just say I love the book because it fills in a lot of blanks for me, but a lot of blanks that people don't even know, uh, information they don't even know exists. Now, look, you have been out there practicing astrology for over 50 years. You're an author. You have seven books, Interest in Metaphysics. Here's the question I want to ask you about this book and about where we are today. In your looking at astrology over the time you've been working with people, what has changed in the field of astrology, but also what has changed with our understanding of astrology? Well, that's a real good question. I waited for you to come to ask that question. No, no, no. It's kind of interesting because you see uh, back, you know, as far back as the Inquisition, they basically 86 astrology when they started killing all the witches. Mm. And uh, it became a taboo subject. So our access to that information has been well hidden and kept from us. In fact, most people are told that it's, you know, if you study a, astrology you're in cahoots with the devil uh and then back about a hundred years ago a little over a hundred years ago at the tail end of the 19th century the there was a a whole movement of uh, people were doing a lot of research into psychic matters and madame blavatsky and the theosophical society sort of came out of the woodwork around that time And slowly but surely through the early part of the 20th century, the momentum for uh, curiosity into the subject of astrology built up. Uh, And I remember, actually, it's funny because back in the early 30s, Evangeline Adams was the the big astrologer. Yeah. My grandmother was into her. 
And uh, there were also a lot of people in Great Britain who were really turned on to astrology. So slowly but surely over time, what's happened is what was suppressed or kept hidden from us began to come back out of the woodwork. Mm. And it was people like Evangeline Adams that set the tone for things because back in her day, back in the 30s, you could get arrested for practicing astrology. Yeah. And what she did is they when they actually busted Evangeline Adams for for doing people's horoscopes and when she wound up in the courtroom uh the judge was a, a very intelligent man who just, uh, instead of, you know, throwing her in jail, said, well, I'd like you to do my horoscope. Oh. And basically, she is the one who, through that experience, made it possible for people who wanted to practice astrology to practice it legally. During that time, there were a bunch of people, okay, who, you know, they're all dead now. It's such a shame. But yeah. there was guy named Mark Edmund Jones and then there was uh, well Dane Rudyard I think Dane Rudyard is dead I think he died a few years back but uh, Mark Edmund Jones and Dane Rudyard Mark Edmund Jones was known as the Dean of American Astrologers and he's the one that really brought it back into a place where people in the um, you know in the academic community uh could could appreciate where he was coming from that it wasn't all just nonsense uh, and and those guys okay were the ones who got everything back on its feet and by the time I came to study astrology uh, it was just beginning to peek its head out of the woods but yeah the business of um, really turning it into a science that actually, you know, had any respect going on to it began in the 60s. Okay, in the 50s and the 60s, there were a bunch of people who were really doing some incredible research into astrology. And one of them happened to be my teacher, uh, who um, basically I was apprentice, I, I took a quick course with him and then was apprenticed to him for two years. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity because that, that was going on in the early 70s. Oh. Uh, but but what he passed down to me, okay, was invaluable because around the same time, all of this stuff was starting to gain more respect. The computer age came along and kind of watered things down a little. So it's interesting. There was a window of time in the late 60s and the early 70s where you could learn about astrology from uh, a living being who yeah. actually uh, been trained by people who knew more about it than they did. Uh, and, and so in the beginning, you know, back in those days, very few people even knew what sign they were. Right. Uh, and as time went on, uh, and and the internet became more of a force in people's lives. What happened is the information that these guys had passed down got disseminated. But on another level, there was a hitch to that because as soon as it sort of hit the masses, uh, all of this stuff that was just beginning to bear fruit, really, intellectually, started to get diluted or watered down by people who were just trying to cash in on superficial aspects of the art. Mm. So on the one hand, um, over time, people have become much more familiar with astrology. Okay, but the extent to which the internet has been helpful in deepening people's understanding of it is questionable. Yeah. And, you know, I totally relate to what you're saying because, you know, I remember going way back and uh, almost the first time, I think, that I sat down with someone and she described herself as uh, doing esoteric astrology. And, you know, I didn't even know what that meant. I mean, now I have a lot more information about that, what that means. But, it, you know, we live in a world, just like you said, where, 
you think you go to somebody's website, you type in your birth date and boom, there you have all the answers. But I've learned from my own chart that that is not necessarily true. And no. today, right? No, that's not true. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, let's talk about the moon for a minute. Sure. Now, I knew that I had a, a moon sign, uh, but I didn't know uh, the relate. I mean, somebody once told me once upon a time uh, where my signs were, what signs I had, what houses they were located in. And, you know, I just thought, oh, great, I'm a Sagittarian, but that's not the whole picture. And so for you, writing this book, The Lunar Gospel, there's something very important about the moon and the moon sign that you wanted to bring forth in this book. Tell us the importance of the moon and understanding what it is, where it is, and what it could mean to us. Oh, good. I love it. Okay. Yes. So, the thing with the moon, okay, and the reason I focused on it in this book is because everybody's got this karmic uh, relationship to this, the, the incarnation, incarnation that they happen to be in. Mm -hmm. And uh, people don't realize it. Uh but there are a lot of things that go on prior to our birth, actually prior to our conception, because the karmic patterns, okay, that roll from lifetime to lifetime are such that every single one of the incarnations that we have had prior to this one, okay, has a direct impact on whatever it is that we wind up doing in this incarnation. And mm -hmm. so the only key that we really have to understanding what that might be, or one of the main keys to understanding uh, where we've coming from, where we're coming from and what type of lessons we're gonna be facing is by developing an understanding of the moon because prior to conception, the soul signs contracts with your higher self and with the creator. And, and the contracts are based on the tally sheet that you've sort of arrived at the gate of birth with uh, relative to your previous life experience and your deeds in those previous lives. And if your karma has taken a certain form, then, then in order for you to evolve as a spirit, there are certain things that have to happen in the upcoming incarnation that will move your soul along the path of evolution. Because contrary to what we've all been led to believe, none of us came here to brush our teeth and drive around in the car and go to the freaking bank. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the deal with this is that your soul is alive and your purpose for living has to do with finding your way back to the source, mm -hmm. right? And each incarnation is given to us in order to basically wind up in a curriculum that's going to help the soul evolve to whatever the next level is. Well, yeah. the whole thing with this planet, uh, time and experience and repetition are the only teachers in the third dimension and what people don't realize, we think we're the penultimate creation. Little does anybody know that the earth is the ass end of the universe. Mm. Okay. And so what happens when you come onto this plane is all you've got to bring with you into your current life experience are the memories of whoever you were and whatever you've processed and experienced in all of your previous lives. And because this planet happens to be placed, a place where time and experience are the only teachers, none of us, the minute we come out of the chute, so to speak, of our mother's womb and land on this planet, not a single one of us has any idea of what we came here to do this time around. And the only point of reference for any of us okay, are the memories that we carry from the previous life ex 
exper uh, experiences. That's all we know about who we are. And the reason I focus on the moon so much is because the moon is the primary indicator for what you've brought in from all of your previous incarnations. And from the standpoint of being a professional astrologer, okay, that sign placement and the house placement of the moon is the first key that I have to who this person is, what their lessons have involved, and what they have their PhD in, okay? And I can look at that and sit down and talk to them and say, okay, well, I know this about you, I know that about you, and this is what you are habitually entrained to want to uh, direct yourself into being and doing and having. But the interesting thing is that the moon will tell me everything there is to know about who they once were. Okay, and I can use it as a guidepost to indicate to me what they're going to spend at least the first 40 years of their life repeating. Mm. Okay, and most people don't know this. Okay, it takes 40 years for your life to even begin because up until that moment, you're still acting out the patterns from the previous life experience. And, and it takes about 40 years to get to the point where you realize that all of that behavior stopped working for you a long time ago. Wow. wow. And, and that's why the moon is important as far as I am concerned, because it gives me an indication of where a person is likely to get stuck. It's also an indication of what it is that they know more about than anything else. Okay, yeah. but because you're supposed to evolve from lifetime to lifetime, um, it's important to indicate to the person that it's it's good that you know all this stuff and that you, this is what you've brought with you from every previous experience. But you can't get stuck there because in this life, you're meant to be directing all of that time and experience in a whole new direction, in the new direction. Okay, or, or the point of purpose for this life is held in two points. One is in the north node of the moon, and the other one is in the ascending sign. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's interesting because sometimes people come to me and they, they're very proud of the fact that, oh, I've got, this, <laughs> I've got the moon and the rising sign in the same sign. Uh, and, and what I say to them at that point is, well, that's great, but, you know, all that means is that you messed up, okay, with your lessons the previous time around. And you, you've had to stay back in the second grade, so to speak, so that you mm -hmm. can repeat that lesson and get it right this time. It's very well, interesting. It is very interesting. And, you know, when we think about how interesting it is, right, we think about, oh my gosh, what am I going through right now? What's happening in my life? And what role does astrology play in it? And, you know, for a really long time, you, you know, people, at least the people that know me, what they want to do is they want to jump up and down and they say, oh my gosh, that explains everything. You're a Sagittarius. But they don't realize, no, no, no. You know, between my eighth and ninth house, I've got something like seven planets, right, all over, bunched over there, and my moon is in Capricorn. And oh. so, you, you know, they see me, and you, they ask you your birth date, and they think, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. So, you know, for somebody like me, I sit here with my moon in Capricorn, you know, of course, my son is in Sagittarius and people think, wow, you have a very interesting split personality, which I don't, yeah, but I I'm not like one size fits all. Does that make sense? Because I think if we look at somebody's rising sign, we want them to, to we, or sun sign, we want them to be that. No, and no, if, no. I right? don't even pay attention to the sun sign. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even pay attention to it, and and and, and let, let me put it this way. Okay, I pay very little attention to it because if the moon tells me 
who you have always been. Mm. Okay, and and the rising sign and 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 the archetype that governs the ascendant tells me um, exactly what your karma in this life is going to be taking you to. Mm. I look at the sun. You know what the sun is? The sun is solar energy. Uh. The sun is solar power. Okay, so so the sign that the sun is in, okay, and in your case, it's Sagittarius, mm -hmm. it's telling me that the type of fuel that you were burning, you are burning, is has got this Sagittarian octane to it. Okay, and that Sagittarian is uh, energy is the octane that you are using to move the stories from the past life toward the direction that you're really meant to be going in in this life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. And, you know, this is why I was so excited to talk to you about this book, because what you do is you take us on a journey of even right on the at the beginning, you know, explaining this is what it means to have the moon, your moon, in a particular thing. So yes. when somebody says, well, your moon's in Sagittarius or your moon is, for example, in Libra or your moon is here, it has a certain meaning and it has a certain descriptor. And I wanted to ask you, please tell us what it means to have our moon there. But your book isn't just about that. It's also about what I think is some very little known bits of knowledge about that's great to have your moon in that, but why does it have a different meaning for somebody that may have it in the eighth house versus somebody that has it in the first? So you bring the conversation even to a deeper level. No, I, I, that's, that's my whole deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my whole deal. I mean, I, I think it's interesting because let, let, let's just, let's, if you don't mind, can we use you as an example? Sure, sure. Okay, so so on the surface, what everybody is relating to, to is the fact that you're a Sagittarian. Well, yeah. that makes a lot of sense right off the bat, okay? Uh, it, even just superficially looking at the fact that you're dealing with disseminating information and you're involved with the media mm -hmm. and also involved with subjects that relate to higher mind activities and uh, spiritual things, because all of that is is definitely one way that a Sagittarian sun might express themselves. I mm -hmm. mean, a Sagittarian sun is either shooting at the stars, <laughs> okay, or they're sort of grounded in the ass end of the horse and, and more interested in doing everything to excess and driving around in fast cars and just going nuts on the physical. <laughs> but the, the key, the key here is this. Okay. So Pat's born with a Capricorn moon. The moon tells me right off the bat that you have been a very important person in a previous lifetime and that you were actually somebody who was one of the members of the collective that everybody looked up to for protection and support and that you have already developed to your fullest possible capacity, okay, the ability to know exactly what needs to happen and how to get it all to work and to have know exactly what it feels like to be the one who knows the most and is the authority on the subject. Okay, so if you're, I don't know what your rising sign is, do you? Do you know? Yes, your, yes, what? I do. My rising sign is Taurus. Oh, I love it. Okay. Is that a <laughs> essentially what's up with you? Okay, <laughs> you know, in a nutshell, it's that this Capricorn energy has, has come to find a way to express itself. Okay, and when Taurus is on the ascendant, there are a million things that go on. First of all, you can assume that if you were the, you know, top cat in the previous life, mm -hmm. 
okay, that money and power and position and things became very important to you. So part of the lesson with somebody who's got a Capricorn moon and Taurus rising, okay, has to do with the fact that, you know, there's a part of your lessons involve, you know, coming to the realization in this life for yourself that the best things in life aren't things. Yes. <laughs> okay, and that you you basically come to a place within yourself where you begin to understand that it's it's really the extent to which a person can begin to appreciate what is real and true instead of all of the outer trappings of the success and power. And that that energy is meant to be used to help you use all of the strength and um, authority that you developed in those other lifetimes to show everybody else you know, how to come to a place within themselves where they're not hung up on that stuff. Mm. And that they you basically come to help everybody figure out how to ground their ambitions and their cravings for outer things and things that are real. Okay, and so learning how to, you know, the, the whole thing, the best things in life and the whole idea of uh, knowing how to make it beautiful, knowing how to connect with a piece of yourself, okay, that is grounded in the place that is totally content with whatever she has is, mm. is where you are personally moving towards and you're using the Sagittarian sun to fill up your tank, okay, and get you to this place. So, in a sense, what you're doing exactly what you came here to do. Because yeah. in a sense, yeah. all the power and authority that you had in the previous life is now being mm -hmm. pulled by this Sagittarian energy that is disseminating the information that is here to instruct people on how to get back to the garden. Yeah. Well, I got something really interesting to share that is directly out of your book. But before I do, and Benny, we're going to skip the breaks if you don't mind. How can people find out more about you, Cal? But most importantly, how can they get a copy of your book? Oh, the book's going to be, the book is on sale on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. And it's mm -hmm. uh, on sale at Indie Books right now in advance of publication. So you can get it there. It will be in the bookstores in, in its physical form on the 1st of April. Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you, I read this part that I'm about to share with people today, and I'm thinking, you got to be bleeping kidding me. So I didn't tell you this. My moon is in the ninth house, right? Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. So I'm reading the thing here, and I get to the part in the book where you say, you said, in keeping with the tendency to get swept away by belief patterns and ideals that have nothing to do with them, the ninth house moon is inevitably confronted with the need to find out where the truth lies. Hello. But yeah. then listen to this. This happened to me. This is where you find people who have gotten beaten by the nuns at Catholic school. That's me at six and wind up retreating into atheism or running off to escape the pain in the Zen silence of a monastery in Tibet. Now, I didn't do that, but I became a spiritual hitchhiker as early back as I can remember, you know. Wow. So I read this and I thought, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. I mean, That's you know, me, six years <laughs> old, Catholic boarding school. My mom was sick and then ultimately committed suicide. And there I was. And I got to tell you, I was beaten every night with an iron brush because I was so spirited. I mean, come on, six years old in Catholic boarding school, who does that, right? Yeah. yeah. But the point that I'm making is that you go through this book and you take us on this journey. Mine happens to be the ninth house moon, <laughs> right? Yeah, big time. Well, isn't it interesting too, I mean, when you think about this, Okay, because Sagittarius rules the ninth house. Mm, that's right. So, so there, there's a connection there that strengthens the whole concept of, you know, having um, 
You know, and, and weird. I mean, we could, I wish I had a copy of your chart in front of me. We could really get into it. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, The whole thing is if you've got the moon in Capricorn in the ninth house, then you've got to have the, uh, the Sagittarius sun in the eighth house. That's which, correct. Which means that there is this whole thing with death being the teacher as well. Mm. Okay. And particularly the death of the mother. Mm. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. Yeah. And so, so, and, and, and this is the thing when you're doing a horoscope for somebody, you're looking at a lot of different variables mm -hmm. and, and the idea of like, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the lunar gospel is great in the sense that it sort of begins to dissect the impact of the moon from a deeper perspective than and what you get from most of the cookie cutter astrology books that just say the moon rules the personality. Well, so frigging what? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I always want to find out more about things. And it's been interesting because I started studying astrology a long time ago. And it, it's, it's been interesting to me because the, it's the people that I've talked to who, who've been... Um, who've been open enough to share the truth about themselves with me when we talk in conversation that have taught me everything I know. And that's where all that stuff comes from. You talk to enough people and they will tell you exactly the same story or some variation thereof. And again, you know, this is why time and repetition and experience are the only teachers here. Yeah. You can only get so much from books. Yeah, yeah. No, and one of the things I want to ask you about, too, because I know this hour is going by so quickly, is, and I hope you will come back, is that there is the birth chart. Now, here's my question. Mm. I mean, I'm really clear, and, and I could tell you right now, when we're looking at my chart, what we're looking at is you know, a bunch of planets in the eighth house, a bunch in the ninth house, and then there are others here, there, and everywhere. But people ask the question, and I get this a lot, but that doesn't really matter about the birth chart because what about this year? What about 2018 when things have moved and changed? So I, I well, wanted to ask you that particular question yeah. because folks think, well, wait a minute, what is the impact now of the solar return and well, how well, does that affect our birth chart, et cetera, or vice versa? Talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So the moment that you're born, the moment that you breathe your first breath, okay, that essentially is uh, the set point for every single thing that happens to you from that point on. That's the timing mechanism for everything. Okay, but at that moment, it's not like anything is frozen in time. Every body in the horoscope continues to move. All right, so that the day after you're born, all of the planets that were static to begin with have inched forward, you know, according to a certain rate of motion. Yeah. All right, and so what happens is that you um, you draw up a separate chart for every year that you're alive, okay, and it looks different than the one that you were born with. Mm -hmm. And for the astrologer, it is the progressed in the solar return horoscopes that account for the fact that your experience changes you, all right? And so the subtle movements and the tiny incremental changes that take place from day to day, from the moment after you're born, okay, begin to show the astrologer exactly how much your experience is change you within a year's time if you're using that method of measurement and mm -hmm. and and that's what most people do every year that you're alive your horoscope is going to look different all right and 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 the way the chart looks exactly a year from your first birthday is going to tell the astrologer exactly what happened okay and how much 
that experience change you? You could be born with a ton of very difficult aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you continue to read the chart from that perspective, you're not going to be able to help the person that you're talking to because by the time they turn 30, uh -huh. all of those very difficult aspects will have softened, okay, into trines and sextiles. And, and that will be the indication that the individual has actually processed the lesson and is now at a different stage of their development as a result of their experience. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense because that has been really my understanding. And I think where people get a little bit confused and you just explained it as, you know, people, you, you go out there and, and you're looking at this and, they, and folks say, all right, you need to get a forecast. And you're thinking, well, I don't know. I could get this transit thing. I could get this solar return thing. I don't know what I'm supposed to get. But, you know, I want to know what the year is going to be about. Is it, I mean, honestly, every time I look at some of this, uh, it, it, it's kind of like, I'm like everybody else. I just want to know, based on what you see, this is, this is where I am. What is 2018, for example, going to mean? What have you found out about the importance of these progressed charts for people? And what insight can they give them based on where the moon is? Oh, the progress moon is everything. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, the progress moon is everything. The, it, look, I don't even, I, I, whenever I do a chart for anybody, okay, I look at the, and I don't care if they're, you know, a baby, okay, or I don't care if they're a 90-year-old person, okay, I'll do the nail chart. And then I will do up the progress chart. You can't even talk to the person unless you progress their chart because yeah. the transits alone will not give you enough information. And uh, uh, the movements of the secondary progressed moon, okay, are, are it is it basically if you're doing predictive work, the secondary progressed moon is the timing mechanism. Okay, so that you can look at a person, you you know, you've already looked at their natal chart, you've told them what their karmic stuff is all about. Yeah. And you've looked at their Venus and Mars, and you've told them a little bit about what they came here to do. When you're, you know, they come to you when they're 40 years old, okay, and you've progressed their chart to the 40th year of their life, their son's going to be in a completely different sign. Mm. Okay, their moon is going to be in a completely different sign. And what people don't understand, it's very interesting. There is significant, you know, the, the larger transits of Saturn, which has a 27 to 30 year cycle, depending on the individual. Mm -hmm. and the larger transits of uh, Uranus and Jupiter all intertwine so that they're moving in this synergistic pattern that is almost like a ballet, okay? And, and you can be sure. It's like, for instance, the secondary progressed moon will be in exactly the same position on in your 27th year as it was on the day you were born. Uh -huh. All right? And the day after what they refer to as your first Saturn return, okay, will be an exact replica on an adult level, on a different octave of what was going on with you the day after you were born. Wow. It is so amazing and mind-blowing, even to me, all right? And, and the problem with life is, of course, we all come here and think that we came here to mate, breed, and go to the bank, okay? <laughs> and the truth is, if they could have bothered to tell any of us that all of this is happening as a means, okay, to move you along a pathway so that the agreements that you signed with your higher self before you were born will be fully activated and completed by the time you die. Yeah. Okay. And everybody gets lost. Because this, like I said, this 
planet. It's the ass end of the universe. Mm. It's a very low vibration, really screwed up place. Okay. Yeah. And what happens? happens to you the minute you come into this system is that you get confused by whatever it is that the programs in the culture inspire you to believe you know and and we get lost okay for the first 20 years of our life trying to figure out what the hell our parents yeah <laughs> uh, uh, have done to screw us up you know, and depending on how that works, because believe me when I tell you, nobody came here to get on the good ship lollipop. Another hour coming up on Transformation Talk Radio. We'll be right back. The preceding audio was via a Skype call. 